We will so, good afternoon, everybody. Here's us again. Um, thank you for patience. Um, last week we couldn't present because I was on vacation and uh, so here we are. So today we will continue our session on issues relating to TESOL research uh, trends and the future of our field. I think they just the topic is quite generic and we are all interested in it. So today we are having a, a guest from Malaysia all the way, Dr. Haida Umiera Hashim. So Dr. Haida is from, I have it written beautifully, University of um, Technology Mara. And uh, Dr. Haida especially, it's what's important for us, is uh, a chief editor of the International Journal of Modern Languages and Applied Linguistics. So I do have a slide of um, the journal. I'll just show to everybody. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Okay. So, um, yeah, for everybody to see, we'll come back to this slide again, but I just wanted everyone to see because we will be talking about it. Um, other than everybody else who has joined us today, I would like to especially welcome our friend from America. It's three o'clock in Michigan, three o'clock in the morning, and she's here online. I just saw her. I don't know on which channel she's sitting, on Facebook or YouTube, but I just saw her coming up. So, Susie Huari, you are the, the most loyal um, viewer of our podcast. Um, so, Dr. Um, Haida. Would you like to tell us something about yourself? Because everybody knows everything about me and my home team. But um, we would love you to actually say a few words about yourself and maybe in addition to how the about the journal and how the journal fits with your work. Right, great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anya. And um, I would like to say thank you for having me. Um, it's nice seeing everyone in person. We've been uh, communicating previously uh, virtually, but now seeing everyone in person, it's so nice. Um, so I'm Haida. Um, I'm from Malaysia, as mentioned by Dr. Anya. So I'm currently a senior lecturer at um, University of Technology, Mara. Um, and I'm in uh, the Faculty of English Language Department from Academy of Language Studies. Um, so previously, um, I've um, had my PhD, graduated from University of Bangsa and Malaysia, um, majoring in TESOL, and my research would be geared more towards uh, technology enhanced language learning and ESL learning. Yeah. So um, this particular topic today would be something that uh, maybe all of us can relate to, and I'm very happy to um, to share, you know, and to exchange views um, and thoughts with regards to the topic. Yeah. So um, I always have questions because I'm a woman and someone told me women don't, can't, can't just talk under the water. We're very good even under concrete. So <laughs> I might just turn first maybe to Lala because um, I understand, Lala, we have um, an association of teachers also participating today, not participating, but being viewers of our podcast. So welcome to everyone. Uh, Lala, would you have some questions prepared so you could just start the discussion, especially since you probably know Dr. Haida a bit better than me? Thank you very much, Anya. Thank you, Dr. Haida. So I, I, I think um, uh, one of the most concerning question in TESOL is, especially in the context of Asia, how can we harmonize the discipline of TESOL with the multilingual diversity uh, of ASEAN? Because ASEAN is the home of uh, more than 666 million inhabitants. And then there are, let's say, 1,000 languages spoken in ASEAN. And there is actually a latest publication from Oxford University where the researchers did uh, an analysis from the literature review saying that uh, the research on multilingualism in the world is uh, actually uh, mostly done in the northern part of the world. But actually, the southern hemisphere of the world, which is actually the most diverse place linguistically, uh, lingu the most diverse linguistic environment is actually underrepresented. Maybe that's actually my concern when I was preparing my slide. Maybe um, 
uh, you could you could share some of your thoughts on this, Dr. Haida. Great, thank you, Dr. Lala. Well, um, I feel like that is a very interesting um, thought because you know, uh, definitely in in the Asian um, countries, we do have a lot of uh, ethnicity, which you know right. um, makes us um, different in the sense of maybe accents and you know linguistics jargons and whatnot. So um, now I feel like with with the help of technology, right, uh, we are more um, I would say we're more open to changes and we're more open to sharing in the sense of getting to know other cultures better and starting to to be a more open to um, different and diversity of language, yeah. I would say. Um, and um, in the sense of um, that as well, I feel like, um, you know, um, authenticity is also important in the sense that, you know, there is no right and wrong. And now, nowadays, um, people or community are starting to understand that, you know, uh, before we are more prone to its accuracy rather than fluency, which is now we are starting to understand that, you know, it's okay if we make mistakes and if it's okay we are, you know, having differences in terms of um, accents or, um, you know, or jargons and whatnot, as long as the message is conveyed. Um, so um, I believe that that particular topic is, um, you know, there's need of more research on that particularly. Yeah. Um, um, and yeah, it, it's quite interesting. Uh, but, you know, um, in the Malaysian context, we don't really have um, that much um, diversity in comparison to Indonesia since, you know, in Indonesia, we have um, other ethnics, you know, such as Javanese, Balinese and whatnot, and that would differ in terms of the languages, right, in terms of the pronunciation, articulation. So I think that that would be uh, something that we should be looking more into and, you know, um, to be to be discussed further. But it's yeah. nice that now, you know, we have all these kind of, for example, podcasts like this that we can, you know, yeah. share our thoughts and views with regards to that as well, yeah. Yeah, okay. So... If I can also, Perhaps I could um, add. I could add something. Sorry, Anya, yeah. just just a second. I, I think it's imp there's a certain things which are important, and we tend to lose them when we start talking about TESO, mm -hmm. because it's not TESO. It's language learning. Yeah, yeah. that's the first yeah. thing, and we get right. we get swallowed by the TESO monster. TESO monster. That's the first thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and 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 I think there's a kind of self-sustaining juggernaut of TESO yeah. which goes and and eats everything, and excludes things. It not just mm -hmm. just include things. It, it doesn't just include English. It excludes everything else, including mm -hmm. the intellectual work, yeah. which is done in other places. For instance, do you know that there's work done in Germany, in Poland? Mm -hmm. In Colombia, you know, yep. we don't talk about that. We talk about Rod Ellis. And, and I, I'm not suggesting that they, these are not important people, but I think that we ignore maybe 90% of the research of the field. That's mm. the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing is, so it's not TESOL, it's, just, it's language learning. And that's one of the reasons why we have the, the International Journal of Modern Languages. That, that Dr. Haider is editing. And I think that's very important. It's a very important point. It's not just about English. Correct. Yep. And, then, and then intellectually, therefore, we need to diversify as well as diversify ethnic, ethnically or in terms of ethnicities, in terms of origins and so on. Now, one of the things that was mentioned is that technology is going to help. Well, technology is going to help because we may not have enough resources to maintain traditional language teaching and culture t teaching, but we may have enough resources to divert towards supporting uh, uh, LCTLs, less commonly taught languages, uh, with, with, uh, and, and, and less commonly taught languages vary according to which country you happen to be in. So, in Thailand, French is a less commonly taught language. I mean, there's five schools in Thailand that teach French. Hey, yeah. you know, that's strange, but it's true. Yeah. Um, so in terms of support and access and, and research, technology may be able to help us quite a lot. But, I, but the, the main point I wanted to make is that it is, it is a mistake 
to think of TESOL as a closed, uh, as a closed um, a community in a sense, and as a closed intellectual area. Everything that we learn from TESOL applies to other language learning, Correct. and everything that we learn from other language learning applies to TESOL. So that dialogue should happen, and it doesn't happen enough. And I think the German that Dr. Haida is working on will be a good instrument to create a meeting ground between those, uh, those kinds of, 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 of uh, concerns. Transferability, I would say, right? In terms of language learning, um, yeah, in comparison to other languages. Yeah, because, um, you know, it, it, the process of learning that particular language, not TASOL in a C, but, you know, the process of learning language itself, it's applicable to all other languages. And yeah, talking about Ijmal, um, it's very important to note that Ijmal does not only receive um, English or Malay language manuscripts, but we also receive other modern languages such as French, German, Mandarin, and Arabic. So uh, that would be a good platform to also, you know, um, celebrate the diversity and language learning um, as a big umbrella. Yeah. You also publish in different languages. I noticed some mm. publications were in English, but not all of them. Yes, yeah. So we also accept um, other languages manuscript in terms of Bahasa Melayu, Malay language, or uh, Mandarin. Uh, but, you know, of course, um, we have uh, the experts in that particular language. Now, the reason being is because number one is the name itself, the International Journal of Modern Languages. So we accept all other languages, as well as because uh, this journal is a homegrown faculty journal by our faculty, Academy of Language Studies. So in our faculty, we, uh, we cater to different um, languages you know, um, English as a second language, as well as the other third languages. So we have lecturers um, from, you know, teaching Mandarin, uh, German, French, um, Spanish even. So, you know, from there, we imported our uh, expertise in that language and, um, you know, um, help have them contribution in uh, Ijma when we receive other submissions from other languages. So if I can just um, ask a little mm -hmm. bit just before Lala might come in again. Um, so I think that a few things were said and I want to draw on those. So one of them was that you are happy that now education is sort of more um, expanded. It's not so much elitist anymore, not only in terms of access, but also in terms of demands. So the old perception that you have to, you can't make mistakes, you know, all these demands that basically were putting uh, speakers of other languages always in a position of submission to the language that they were actually using, now are pretty much gone, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't be teaching. And I think that, so that's a positive, but um, we have the challenge here that we have to respond now to the en masse education, which means yeah. we, as Andrew was saying, we now have to, think of ways of in, not so much improving but reflecting on what we do and uh, in a way that actually talks to many not just one percent of the one percent i think that's that um i wanted to ask you whether um so uh, Andrew was talking about communication between international scholars. It happened to me, but it just happened that I met Andrew when um, I was still uh, towards my in my you know when I was still at university. I was I was just in my first year PhD, and I was um, at the University of Queensland. Where we were, and I kind of was a wanderer. I walked between departments all the time. But Andrew happened to introduce me also to some people I really wanted to meet. So, for example, Anne Friedman, who was the semiotician, French semiotician. So I wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Haida, in your publications, I'm not sure, obviously you don't read every one of them because it's not possible, humanly possible. But did you notice in some of your publications there was a dialogue between, say, the French scholars and the German scholars and the Malaysian scholars and the Chinese scholars and the English scholars? Did they draw on each other? Or is everyone still sitting in their own little languages and uh, fields of thinking? 
Right, great. Thank you, Dr. Anya. So, yeah, it's true that you uh, you mentioned that because, yeah, when when we come to think of it, um, it's interesting to see different languages in a way somehow um, carry themselves alone. So there's no dialogues between, let's say, French uh, with English and um, Mandarin, etc. So um, I realized that uh, there is none when you mentioned that to me. So, uh, however, we have um, one lecturer from our faculty. Um, he's a German lecturer, so German language lecturer. So, um, he's one of his publications um, that is um, a presence of um, the integration of English language um, and German language. So, that's where we can see that, you know, um, he's the only person who kind of integrates English, but the rest are on their own. Mandarin with Mandarins and let's say Malay language, they only analyze uh, Malay language um, as a whole, but none integrated to um, English language. Yeah. So there is lack of it. I can say that. Yeah. Um, and um, there's not much. And also when it comes to um, the faculty as well, we can see that um, each to their own, meaning that um, the English lecturers will, you know, just discuss about English um, research as a whole, and then Mandarin lecturers will discuss the language of uh, learning language, Mandarin language as a whole on their own. So there is no migration of um, other languages, and um, yeah, it, it could be something that worth um, conducting a study on or worth discussing, yeah, but I can see that there is lack of that, definitely. Andrew, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I I was thinking along slightly different lines, which is not that there should be a mix of, of, of languages connecting with other languages or with each other necessarily, although everything that we do is about multilingualism, right? I mean, when we, when we teach English, we don't just teach English in a vacuum. We teach English to Chinese or teach English to Indonesians or right. So there's always that context, but I, uh, the point is that intellectually we don't connect, and I think that's the that's the important point. So, for example, if I do if I do some work, I might use uh, French postmodern thought to some extent. I might use uh, uh, Croatian theories. I might. I, I'm not saying that I do. I actually I do, but that's not the. But that's not the only the only thing. So 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 you can mix some uh, some Bourdieu in with some with some Derrida and with some uh, Rodelis. Uh, actually, I probably wouldn't do that, but let's say that uh, that I would with a bit of with a bit of Guberina. And so you have you have a much richer collection of stuff. You might want to bring Sugatamitra in there, and Sugatamitra is Indian, but he lives in Britain. The other point I wanted to make is that we're all, you know, we're, we're now in this kind of diversity um, mindset. But the diversity is actually, the mi mindset is not new. It's about 50 years old already. But it's just coming to a, to a peak at the moment with uh, English as a lingua franca becoming a big deal. Um, where, where people say, oh, you know, we will recognize that you, you can be uh, not like a native speaker. But actually, most of us who are so-called native speakers are not like native speakers already. We're all mixtures. So we all have accents which are not, you know, in terms of, if we talk about accent for one moment, uh, we don't all sound like Prince William. Right. right. I mean, we don't. Even if we happen to be British, we don't sound like him. If we and we don't sign provi sound provincial either necessarily, I mean we we the, over time we we become mixed, and the accents that we have. I mean I don't know. I actually seriously, I don't know what accent I now have. <laughs> when when I was little, I went to a British school, so I I spoke maybe with a rather British accent. I don't know. But but uh, since then, I've now we can hear your British accent, Prof. Well, now you can hear that. I did it on purpose. I did it on purpose. I didn't. I don't speak like that normally. But uh, you know, I I 
for the sake of it, I, my, my PhD is in French. So, um, you know, <laughs> I, can, I can work in French very easily. In fact, I'm bilingual in French and English. And so my French actually touches my English, although, and my English is my fourth language, by the way. So it's, it's kind of interesting that we, we tend to think of language learning as a kind of, or have been thinking of kind of language learning as a kind of monolith, but actually it's not. We are all dynamically changing all the time. I lived in America for six years. I have some American accent in my voice. I lived in Australia for many years. I've got some Australian in my voice. I don't sound Australian like this, but <laughs> but I do try not to, right? I, I try to sound like a, a cultivated Australian. So, you know, there's a notion of education, educated Australian. So, oh, what language, what, what's your accent, Andrew? Oh, it's educated Australian. I don't actually say that, but that's what people think. So I wanted it, to... I wanted yeah, to continue. So, so what I'm, well, I'm sorry, but what I'm trying to say is that you finish up with a kind of endless mixture. And people like me, people like Anya, and, and people probably like you, Dr. Haida and, and Lala. Yeah. I mean, you're all mixes because you've sure. come from yeah. different backgrounds, you've come from different cultures, you've come from different linguistic areas. Um, goodness me, why try to keep it pure? I mean, there's nothing. Purity, there's no, there's no purity. It's all an illusion. I just wanted to continue on that issue of um, modern languages as opposed to TESOL or a journal of French or something. Uh, I think that sometimes policies or let's call it a policy, calling the journal this way, mm -hmm. sometimes they run ahead of us. I mean, we're I mean, maybe Andrew or Lala may not agree, but that's my experience. Sometimes someone puts up a challenge like the name of a journal and we're playing catch up to really try to understand the purpose. So I think in terms of Susie Huari's question to you, I would just basically mention it, but you can read it uh, in the comments. Can you see the comments, Dr. Haida? Um, if, if you, on the right side, if you click on comments, there's... Comments, I see. All right, right, okay, 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 yeah. Okay, so I just so I think that what Andrew meant by transferability is um, is intellectual transfer transferability, mm. not necessarily languages talking to one okay. another. But you said that there is less of it or not enough of it in your journal. Um, was that intellectual transferability the objective oh, behind okay. the journal? Right. Okay. Now that you, I, I thought the question was previously with regards to uh, language uh, transferability. So when um, Prof. Andrew explained about intellectual, I believe that there is some sense of um, intellectuality transferability. You know, in terms of, you know, uh, when it comes to language learning, the let's say the theories that would involve the same theories of let's say cognitive theories. Um, you know, all the same coming from the same um, uh, founding fathers of theories and whatnot. So that might happened uh, within other languages manuscripts but uh, of course um, maybe one of the constraints as well from us uh, would be um, to have um, other resources from other languages for example is because maybe of the language barrier in a sense that we, we don't understand um, you know and articles from other countries that we are not familiar with maybe that could be one of the constraints but if as basic as uh, having um, transferability in between uh, intellectual um, in the sense of using you know Mandarin languages um, using theories from uh, as simple as Vygotsky for example language learning so that is presence but um, beyond that I would say maybe in terms of um, you know referring to the use of models or theories that is presence but beyond that it's you know something that um, I'm not so sure myself, but I don't really see that much. Yeah, but in terms of theories, the basic theories and whatnot, I can see that. But um, others and beyond that level, um, I don't. I don't see that um, just yet. I believe it'd be interesting to create um, a, a sort of uh, what do you call it? Those special issues where people yeah. actually 
invited to draw on a variety of frameworks from yes, different yeah. authors from different countries. I just wanted to ask you also before I let go. Um, so we have now, um, so journals in language teaching are now proliferating all around the world, especially mm -hmm. in Asia. And this is a good thing, I think. But I would like a, a very um, articulate, articulated explanation, very well articulated explanation. What was the reason, the exact reason why your university decided to have this, to launch this journal? If you could explain, why? Why? Why not simply write to other journals? Why have your own? Okay, all right. So the reason being is, of course, um, at the first place, this journal was meant as a homegrown um, journal where to help assist um, our staffs of uh, faculty members to, you know, to kickstart with their research and start publishing. So um, this journal is free of charge. So in a way, that would be an advantage to help them to practice um, you know, publishing and whatnot, as we know that other journals out there, you know, um, charges um, quite high publication fees and article processing fees. So that that is one of the reasons why. As well as we would like to uh, maintain the identity of um, us being Academy of Language Studies consisting of different uh, languages. Um, so that being said, hence that's why I can say that uh, this journal, Ijmal, is, um, you know, one of the journals that promote uh, or accept manuscripts other than English and Malay language um, articles. So that's the identity that we are trying to um, trying to keep for our faculty. Lala, would you like some to um, continue your questions? Yeah, I think um, in ASEAN context, it is important for us to have a homegrown journal. I think in my university, every single department is required to have uh, their own journal, not only because we need it for um, accreditation, uh, right? So this is number one. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, I think it is important for, for us to, to develop, uh, let's say, uh, an intellectual sharing system where, where people could actually read the works of our mm -hmm. colleagues, our students, to the world. Uh, I've got experience in, in 2018 when my friend from Sydney came to Turbon and she asked me, Lala, where can I find a publication on uh, Tari Topeng, Mass Dance on Turbon? I couldn't find it in your uh, uh, journal or in your website. So I think that's actually one of uh, the most important re reflections because I live in a very multicultural and multilinguistic uh, area. Uh, there are so many things that we could actually explore in terms of research and intellectual development in relation to our English language teaching practices. So I think that's uh, actually one of the reasons I am. So let me, let me let me just say a couple of things about that. I think there's a serious danger that we will have a proliferation of journals where which are aimed at publishing the publications or the articles of the department which owns the journal. I think that's that's a problem. Uh, so we need to make sure that the journal attracts more than just the locals. The second thing is that at the moment, as everybody here knows, we need to make sure that the journal is indexed in the right places. Because no one will, I will not publish. I mean, I might publish <laughs> because for sentimental reasons. But in general, I will not publish in places which are not Scopus indexed or ISI, uh, uh, whatever it is, ISI, Web of Science uh, uh, journals. I won't because the univ my university doesn't recognize anything else. So in a sense, these are nurseries. These are nurseries for, for, uh, for people. We have a journal in Vietnam, which uh, we are, Anya and I are both involved in it, uh, which has been in existence for two years. It's had 640 ref, uh, um, citations, uh, many in, 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 uh, in Scopus journals and so on. And, and so, you know, one day it may become a Scopus publication itself. I think we need to, we need to make, make sure of that. Because I think it's otherwise, it, no one will come and want to publish with you or us or whoever, you know, it's not, not, not just this journal. 
But I, the, the other point I wanted to make is that I think it's very important to have low-cost publication of articles independently of who publishes. I think it's, it's, we have a responsibility to the, to, to the world, basically, to make stuff known. And we don't have to pay, you know, some places, I don't know, I heard worth $3,000 for an article. I mean, it's just nature, maybe. Um, well, it was, was a ridiculous amount of money. And people say, oh, well, you can get it back from your university. Well, I can assure you, I would not ever get it back from my university. Uh, and, and unless my article was a world beater, well, of course, everybody thinks that their articles are world beater, um, the no, no one's going to actually pay that, that, kind, of, that kind of money. And that is an, is that a, it's, it's a, a real hurdle for the development of the field. And that's why the American publish like yeah. crazy because they have the funding. Right. And the other the thing I wanted to say was to make a comment for Susie Khoury uh, very quickly. Uh, she's talking about accuracy versus fluency, perhaps both in tandem, but accent is irrelevant to both. Actually, accent is not irrelevant to both. Accent is a question of accuracy versus fluency. But it's, I also wanted to point out, we've just finished a PhD study with me uh, just a couple of weeks ago, which actually demonstrated that accuracy and fluency are not antagonistic. This, this old story by, oh, Peter, what's his name? Skian, I think it was. Uh, that accurate was it skiing? Maybe not. Anyway, one of these guys was they, they've all been saying, Oh, you can be accurate or you can be fluent, but you can't be both. Not true, it just isn't true. If you, or at least if you get the conditions right, you can do both. Uh, the, the, the growth may not be along, it, it might not be equal. I mean, in other words, you may not, when accuracy goes up, you may not also get more fluency, but over time you do. And over a short period of time, like 12 weeks, which is what the, what the study by uh, Zhang Xiaobing, the study showed that you, is that, is that accuracy does not have to demolish fluency and fluency does not have to demolish accuracy. Admittedly, this was also done within a very special context where we use dichotic listening techniques. Uh, and we can, for those of you who are interested, we'll talk about them on Monday. Oh, yeah, during the uh, conference or workshops. Uh, yes, but I won't, I won't be there physically. I won't be there physically because I. But you'll make that. a presentation. Yes. Um, so, so, Dr. Um, uh, Haida, so. I also think that it's important to have a place where you store um, local discussions. And I don't know how local are local, because I think you have publications probably from all over the place. Um, is your journal somehow uh, listed somewhere? Is it indexed? Or is it in the plan? Or is it too new at the moment? Um, we are currently in the process of um, applying for my site is Malaysian Citation Index. Um, and as per discussed with Prof. Andrew, uh, hopefully in the near future, we'll be uh, gearing towards um, getting um, Ijmal Index in Scopus. That's what my aim as well. But, you know, um, it's, you know, um, I'm currently new in maneuvering this journal. So I just received the position, but that's what I'm aiming for. And I believe that having um, Dr. Anya and Prof. Andrew um, as part of our advisory board members, that would be um, helpful in the sense of, you know, helping Ijmal to grow, uh, not only locally, yes, definitely locally, but also globally to be known and can be a platform for um, intellectual exchange, I would say. Yeah. So... Um, I wanted to, I, I usually have two issues to express, so I don't know which one to start, but one of them is uh, for you to uh, maybe explain to us or maybe for you to say to us um, that maybe you would consider things like this. The needs to, the, the, it, because the, the journal wants to grow in its impact, I think it's good also for the editorial board to have a strategy to improve the quality of papers. I looked, I didn't look at many, I looked at few. I actually copied one which I want to show and I'll show you now what I'm thinking of. Well, first of all, I have to say, 
They're very good publications, extremely well presented. In some way, they don't really differ much from the publications I see around, but it doesn't mean that they are um, publications that you would die for to read in order to become a professor. But I think there is data there in the ones that I saw, there is data there that is ex very, very useful for me. So I think the strategies of... Uh, for um, the publishing authors to maybe consider so that they, when they publish again, um, maybe it will be harder for them. But now with the AI, honestly, I am totally, totally swallowed by chat GPT. I'm not saying that it will plagiarize or anything. You have questions. Uh, you can talk to it. Not only it improves your expression, you can ask it, could you please... Uh, say the same, but in an academic style, you know, or correct my grammar, or whatever question you might have. But I paid now $20. Um, I think it's a month, $20. But on the um, iPhone, you can get $60 per year. Um, so it's cheaper than what I have paid for. Anyway, so so that's that. So feedback. But the other thing I was going to say so feedback, direct feedback to authors, but something that I used as a coordinator of Coursework Masters in my university, we we were thinking how to in, use Coursework Masters to improve our, our publication output and also our relationships with the community, teacher community, and for the teacher community too, to benefit from doing masters with us, also have publications so that they can actually get, um, um, what, what's the word for it? I just forgot, you know, so that they can progress their career and get, um, what's the word, um, improved, you know, Credit. like they, pardon me? Credit. No, you, you get, you go from senior lecturer to associate professor, what Promotion. do you call it? Promoted, right, I forgot this word for some reason. Anyway, so actually it worked with a student that I worked a lot, like within two or three years after she's finished master, she be, she got promoted and she's on a pretty good salary now, pr pretty much getting the same as I'm getting, though she's working in a school. So what we did, which I'm not sure whether it will be continued now, but as you work with your graduate students, and I know that in Indonesia, there is this um, requirement to write a thesis, which is a small sort of um, research project. What we did when I was this, um, the coordinator, we then had, so after the student finished their research project, then someone like me, so the supervisor who worked with that particular student would take that um, essay or, or thesis or whatever it was, and then rewrite it. But not just for editing, obviously, I had to check every text that my students were reading. And obviously, my students made mistake, misread, and so on and so on. Until, and sometimes it would take me a year to rewrite it. But I learned from it. They learned by studying what they wrote or by comparing what they had written and what I have written by comparing the two. It was like a, you know, um, um, lightning striking them it was just like oh my god but it made sense to them it was meaningful because they understood the text they understood they were um connected or they were already um linked with the subject uh, of the chapter so anyway so that was one way to actually build the local expertise and enhance that expertise by um enabling the mentors to be more proactive in, in um, finalizing these publications. So, so working with students, but also strategies for feedback to improve the quality of text. Um, Heather, do you ha have you thought as the as, a, as an editorial board, have you thought of some of those strategies? Have you got some in place already? Um, yeah, of course, um, definitely this um, Idrimal is a double peer reviewed, um, you know, um, journal. So we have um, the reviewers uh, to review and give comments. And um, I'm starting to realize that back in the days, the practice was um, to have, you know, um, 
you know, the reviewer to give comments and then the authors revise and give the amended version without without us, um, the editors, to see, you know, what are the comments given and the corrections and whatnot. So now I'm making it a practice that um, whenever the reviewers give comments and then, you know, um, the authors will have to revise according to the comments by using any some sort of track changes and whatnot. So I, it will be me who will be in charge to have a look at whether the um, comments have been corrected or not. So, and I also see the comments whether, you know, not only in terms of the editing or just, you know, technicalities of it, but also the content wise. Um, and in terms of what you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, students' theses or project paper and whatnot, we have that as a practice here in Malaysia in which um, we are starting to um, apply that with undergraduate students now uh, for starters, for beginners. So that's where Ijmal plays a role. Um, you will have our undergraduate students, you know, once they are done with their project paper and dissertation, uh, you will help them to convert their project into um, a publishable manuscript and then they will submit. So they will go through the process of submitting on their own and getting the comments and feedback. So that in a way will, you know, somehow help them. Um, that is for undergraduate students. But for postgraduates, that has become a norm where um, each postgrad student, they will have to publish. Um, and they will have to um, achieve certain requirements. So nowadays, I think the most basic ones would be they need to have at least two publications in Scopus in order for them to graduate. So they have um, had that in practice in Malaysia. Uh, but, um, you know, um, other than that, they are available to um, publish their content anywhere else. But also I can see that nowadays... Um, supervisors or educators are becoming more proactive with regards to publications. You know, one thing is because of accreditation and then we have this KPI in, in Malaysia where, you know, we have to achieve a certain uh, amount of publications uh, annually. So I can see that um, educators are making use of that strategy, you know, in guiding um, the students to be more proactive in publications and publishing, I would say, yeah. Yeah, but I was also saying that the mentor can then take that groundwork done by the graduate students and take it seven steps forward. Correct. And in that way, you get a publication uh, of a higher quality and it enhances the, the publication level of the journal, yes. which would be a great thing to see. Correct. Um, I wanted to ask a question, another question, but I forgot now. So I'll just leave, <laughs> leave it to Lala now <laughs> and I'll just remind yeah. myself. So, Dr. Haida, do you think that it is easier for a Malaysian to write in English compared to uh, people in Indonesia? Because English has a different status in Indonesia. We we label English as a foreign language, right? So in Malaysia, it's a national language, right? So based on your experience, how hard or how easy it is for you and your students, both in the undergrad and graduate level, to publish in English? Um, um, well, I cannot speak for all, but I believe that when it comes to um, students that are coming from the background of English or majoring in, in English, that would be easier for them, right? But I can say that at least um, the students without the background of English, they could at least possess the basic um, way of writing. So they have like, you know, somehow the templates. But of course, there's a bit of here and there polishing needed but the message is conveyed so that's what i would say um but i i, I cannot say um i've never had experience with uh, anyone from indonesia but i believe that we've received quite a few numbers of um manuscripts from indonesia for ijmal and i can say that um you know they are good as well um you know it's pretty much the same in comparison okay. and nothing differs too much i would say yeah but any it is a polishing of course but yeah. message is conveyed after all yeah all right I have a question. I remember now. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, Prof. So, Andrew is back. Yeah. Uh, he was back before. I just didn't see him because I had to move the screen. So, um, and, and the same Actually, with your I, I, I disconnected myself rather stupidly. <laughs> okay. So um, so one of the things we, we've been discussing since the last uh, podcast we had, and we will continue for another few uh, podcasts, the question which is about trends. Obviously, I don't want you to summarize the entire field, but first of all, what do you think is mostly 
the subject of publications. If you can, if you if you think of something, then it's great. If you can't think because it's just everything, then no problem. So, what do you think people mostly publish recently about? And secondly, uh, what do you think are important issues? Okay, um, I can feel that there are two uh, main common topics that I can see regularly. Uh, nowadays, yeah, in the current um, present day. So number one would be um, language learning strategies. So um, researchers will investigate how um, learners learn the language um, and how learners you know, improve their own language skills and whatnot, language proficiency. And then number two would be because of the globalization and the idea of you know, fourth industrial revolution and technology coming in. So that's where researchers play around the idea of a research about technology, the use of technology, the impacts of technology with regards to language learning and with regards to TASOL, I would say. So these will be the two main topics that I find regularly. And, you know, to be honest, even me and myself were thinking of the same thing. I'm always gearing towards the use of technology um, and, you know, behavioristic way of learning a language. And that would be the things that I feel the two common uh, topics that are in trend currently, I would say. But yeah, but it's interesting now. Now that now that we've done this sharing session, it's very interesting to see uh, what Prof Andrew mentioned about you know transferability in terms of intellectual. You know, it's always about more like technical way of learning. But what about you know the transferability in terms of intellectuality and um, frameworks? Yeah. Um, would you like to talk about some of the slides here, which I magically okay. found on the screen? All right. Okay. Um, so I can navigate this on my own, right? The slides? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I'm just going to mention about a few things about the background of um, TASOL or TASOL in the Malaysian context. So back in the days, um, English was not really um, put emphasis, I would say, you know, but because um, of this one starting point by University of Malaya that talks about um, that they see a view of establishing a department of languages. So this is where then UITM, my university, initiated um, the uh, establishment of a language center in which, um, you know, um, overall in Malaysia now, in each university, we have our own Academy of Language Centers that will help to um, cater to the issue of language proficiency um, among undergraduates or graduates, and they come under different um, identities or entities. So. Uh, in Malaysia, it is compulsory for the undergrad students to undergo industrial training. So this is where the issue comes in, where they see that there is a need for um, at least basic English proficiency skills because of the demands from the industries, you know, let's say uh, from um, a sample here from a study in 2008, which is you know still relevant up until now, we can see that English has become the language requi requirement regardless. So if they are to work, um, they need... To, to possess at least the basic English language. So from there, the Ministry of um, Higher Education is seeing the emphasis or the necessity to have uh, Academy of Language Centers to help to cater to these problems. Um, yeah, so um, at least, right, uh, these Academy of Language Studies uh, all around Malaysia uh, from each institution, the aim is to at least uh, provide the students with an acceptable level of communication competence. Um, and even for foreigners, international students, when they enter, um, when they um, register for the public institution here in Malaysia, one of the requirements is they have to go through uh, English prof for proficiency course, um, as well as they will have to sit for our um, examination, which is the Malaysian University English Test MWET. So this is where we will see their level of proficiency in order for them to at least to be able to, you know, uh, adapt to the... Um, to the medium um, of um, languages here in Malaysia. Um, so these would be the types of um, uh, Academy of Language Studies uh, in, in each institution. So in UITM, we have Academy of Language Studies. So basically uh, what we do is we provide servicing courses uh, servicing is defined by, you know, um, ranging from uh, providing courses um, from English for basic communication skills to English for uh, professional communication skills. So these will cater to um, undergrads preparation uh, for the workforce environment, at least to have a basic 
competence knowledge uh, or proficient in English language. And this would be some of the uh, Malaysian associations of languages and linguistics that I've um, gotten to find out. Um, okay. Um, all right, so this is basically the same. So we will cover uh, on the second bullet, if you were to see, we will cover um, in terms of uh, giving presentations, listening with deep understanding to presentations in English, uh, reading academic literature, writing books and general articles at uh, an international level. So uh, these were some of the courses that uh, were available at each uh, Academy of Language Studies in each institution to help to cater to um, the students. Um, yeah. So these were, you know, now that you mentioned about um, the common uh, research trends, right? So these was one of the um, studies that I did before. So I realized that there is a lack of, um, how do I say, a lack of um, setting, uh, environment setting or encouraging uh, setting for ESL learning. So of course, just like what we have discussed previously, it's, you know, it's all about the learning process, the language learning process, not TASOL as a whole. Um, so it is very important um, for us to have, you know, the right environment, the right, uh, meaning that, um, you know, a very um, encouraging and a very, um, motivating kind of environment in which, you know, the students are free to communicate in English without concerning about the errors, I would say, without concerning about their own grammars. Uh, so these were some of the, um, you know, uh, research back then. But I would like to maybe point your um, attention to this okay, one. This one would be um, a benchmarking, the comparison of benchmarking between the benchmarks and Malaysian schools here in Malaysia. So um, this is something that may be lack of research as well, uh, in which we can see that, um, you know, in Malaysian schools overall, there is no proper diagnosis. So English is taught from, you know, from the primary school, but in the end, when students are done with their high school, they are not able to be proficient. So what's the problem? So there is no proper diagnosis and a more restricted scaffolding. I would say a lot of textbook being used, but you know, there is no comprehensive scaffolding. There is no collaborative, which is now I can see that the, the, um, the, the energy is gearing towards that or um, there is more effort towards providing more collaborative learning in the classroom. Um, and also, um, we can say that nowadays, there is more realization of, you know, the importance of meaningful content, you know, rather than just, um, I can say that, you know, some of the textbooks in um, now, um, you know, making use of contents that are not relatable to the students, contextually and culturally, for example, let's say um, a text with regards to a celebration that is not being celebrated by Malaysians, you know, like how, how would they relate to that if they are not in that position of celebrating that? So nowadays, you know, there are more realization towards that in making the content to be more meaningful. Um, and also uh, in addition of the other uh, factors such as teacher's role as instructor, as facilitator, and also limited resources now has been addressed by the use of technology. So these would be some of the things that, you know, I think worth um, venturing into when it comes to research because, you know, there are a lot more when, when we say TASOL and language learning. So um, more research should be explored. Um, but this would be um, one of the things that I would like to share with you with regards to uh, my research in my master's degree with one of the lecturers for a course, which we, um, which we investigated the use or the factors that uh, somehow um, has boosted the learner's motivation to learn or to acquire English post-colonialism. So narrative inquiry was conducted where the respondents, you know, wrote their own, uh, somehow we call diaries of their previous experiences um, in learning English. And this is what we have gathered. One is the family influence. So nowadays, um, it is realized that family are starting to see the importance of English, the importance of, you know, um, acquiring English, not only for um, studying, but also in the workforce environment and also in, in the long run, mass media influence. So environmental factors and the mass media influence also play a role. Uh, peer pressure and teachers influence. So they say that peers also play a role 
through peers, they are more comfortable to learn, they are more comfortable to communicate. Uh, it helps them with their confidence level and motivation as well, motivation to learn, and teachers. So they believe that teachers somehow play a role. They've gone through or they've encountered teachers who are very by the book and, you know, just teach and teach. But there are teachers who are also um, act as a designer and a facilitator of learning a language. So they believe that teachers also play a role. And the last and the last two would be technology invasion and external force. External would be the syllabus, the motivation to score in English, as well as to be able to interact with the native speakers like what we did now, uh, you know, uh, exchange of views and opinions and being able to um, communicate and interact with native speakers that could be uh, helpful um, in helping them to acquire English language. So this would be uh, very interesting for me uh, to see um, these, you know, would be um, some of the factors that have um, resulted to um, learners um, having the motivation or being able to be proficient in English language. Well, that thank you for that. That was very, I'm glad I found this PowerPoint. I'm so sorry I missed it somewhere in all of that data. Um, I've got we're about to close. I, I would like to maybe... Um, okay, so Andrew, do you want to comment, make, make a comment on the PowerPoint, on whatever you heard just now? Well, I, I, I'll make a couple of quick comments. Um, I, I think it's a very, very interesting study. And, and, and I think that all of these... Uh, um, sections which have been identified are, are, uh, are really uh, important. What I think, though, I mean, I, I think we also do a lot of studies which worry about the conditions for the teaching and the learning. But we don't do enough inquiry about the overarching intellectual frameworks of the teaching and the learning. In other words, these are essentially conservative research projects, which is how are we doing with the, with the teaching that we're doing now? Instead of saying, and, and, and I, I know this is going to sound stupid, but instead of saying, well, let's just throw everything out and start again. Uh, with, the, with, the, with the teaching and the learning, not with the study about the teaching and the learning, which was a great study, and, and I think identifies kind of universal issues anyway. Um, but but we, we, a lot of, I mean, when you look at the world of, say, of computer-assisted language learning, there's a heck of a lot of studies which talk about professional development, standards of technology that is teachers should have and how they should do. But nobody says, well, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> and that's kind of worrying because all it means is, oh, we're doing okay, we're doing okay, we're doing okay, but, but let's see what we can do to make people more motivated. For example, motivation. We've had 40 years of motivation studies and we're still doing more motivation studies. We've got 40 or 50 years of anxiety studies and we're still doing anxiety studies. Why? Because we haven't solved the problem. And actually, if you just transfer that to speaking, listening, reading, and writing, we also haven't solved that problem. So we're still swimming after thousands and thousands of articles by really smart people on how to achieve these things. We're still running around in circles. And I think we identify the problem correctly, but I think that... Um not always follow it. You see what I'm saying? Because I think that the, the issues you have, I like the solutions, I like all of that, but these are complex things. And I, at the risk of hijacking it, I just wanted you to see something that I looked at. So, and we will continue. And I think that maybe Andrew and Lala will take it or you will take it from there. So Andrew said that we're continuing having the same issues and maybe some solutions are increasingly the same, suggested the same solutions. And we need to think, why is it that we're running? Is it like a generation forgets? Or I don't know. But anyway, let me look at this one. So that was published in your journal. Extremely well written. You know, 
you know, a lot of good data, as I said, very useful. Very, you know, you can make use out of it. So when I refer the articles, I don't always look at it at from the perspective of what I would have written or what I would have liked to say, but whether the presentation is fine, whether it's understandable, and and also whether there is something in it that people can use, right? Because we're not replica of ourselves. So somewhere so they talk about the um, european reference framework for languages um so they collected data on uh teachers perception because you were talking about accountability and you were talking about benchmarking which made me think that that might be actually worth actually sharing in this podcast from your journal, so um, so they were saying that that's the framework that applies. And I, from my discussions with Andrew, it actually the framework applies throughout Southeast Asia. And the finding were, findings were indicating that teachers lack understanding of of the framework, of the concepts, of how to work with it. So basically, we've got this blah. <laughs> And we don't know what the blah is, right? Um, and then they were saying that um, it creates workload problems because people don't know what to do with it. Then on top of it, they also have, like you mentioned, textbooks that they don't think that they can work with. So that generates more workload. I have to say to you, if I replaced CEFR with the Australian curriculum, just with the words, the Australian curriculum, I could have copied that and pasted it in Australia and everybody would agree that this is Australia. I could have changed English into French or whatever. So why am I saying that? Well, first of all, if I were to give advice to this person who wrote this paper, I think this was a group of people who wrote it. Um, I would say if, S, if, C, if, if C, E, F, R was the object of interest in this paper. I would have liked to see way more space given to theorizing the framework. There's a lot of documents that actually try to theorize, and it's a lot. It's a mine um, of documents there, maybe too much to cope. But I think it is worthwhile for people to actually go through those doc that documentation and then see how they can simplify it to make it their own and write about it. And then I would have adjusted somehow the questions in order to have a look how much people understand. So probably, you know, there would have been this... Um, mismatch between how I have framed the model and now how you know, the, the difficulties would have still arisen in, because teachers don't know much about the framework. So the data was good, but I would have liked to see a bit more text, which is more theorized and maybe also which would suggest how the framework could be workable or what is in the framework, but it is so advisable. If it is advised by so many people, maybe there is something in it that we're missing. So, um, so yeah, I didn't find much. I just think that the framework was just said it is there. And all, all we will do is basically check whether other people can understand it. Well, we all, they don't, we all know that they don't. In Australia, most people, most teachers don't understand the Australian curriculum. And they also have workload problems as a result. It's a very simple curriculum, but it's only simple if you understand it. It's, 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 it's overcrowded if you don't. So that's the sort of thing uh, that struck me with this paper. Not enough time was given to the issue, which was really the focus, not the teachers that they don't understand, but what should they understand? What is it that they should have understand, understood? And then see whether they really got the point, right? So under, explain what the teachers should have understood and then research whether they actually are on the same page with you. When it comes to textbooks, I have my own view on it, but I think it's beyond the scope of this podcast. I'm just not going to go there. 
But part of the problem with CEFR is it's, it's the same problem as with everything else that we have had in the past with proficiency scales of some kind. It's not a, the CEFR is not a proficiency scale. It's a framework. <clears throat> and it's a framework which is, which is uh, couched in a language which is so broad that it is almost meaningless. Uh, what I mean by that is if you look at, at past proficiency rating uh, systems, which have had descriptors connected with them, like IELTS or ASLPR, ISLPR, and, and, and so on, <clears throat> the actual meaning of the of the uh, of the of the of the of the proficiency bands is not in the words of the proficiency bands it is actually in the training which people receive from trainers who position themselves as intermediaries between the proficiency band descriptors and human users if you see what i'm trying to say so People don't, I mean, if you look at the actual proficiency levels or the, uh, the OPI, the oral proficiency interviews in, in the American uh, Council of Teaching Foreign Languages system, <clears throat> you don't, you cannot, in order to become a, an accredited tester, you cannot just apply the scales. You have to go to a testing, to a, a, a training session or many training sessions. You have to rate a whole bunch of people. You send your ratings to somebody else who says, yes, you have understood or no, you haven't understood. So the descriptors mean nothing. Sorry, I mean, they mean something, but they don't mean much without the intervention of humans who actually hold the truth in their hands not from the pieces of paper that they're supposed to represent. So I think this is a really serious problem and, and a very dangerous one because people can, you know, we can move with fashion, we can move with our understandings. If people say, you know, short sentences or long sentences or good intonation or, or more or less understandable or whatever it is that the CFR and, and other scales say, it's not going to be enough. So we have a real, real, real problem uh, and so the, the, the thing about CEFR is that it is so general that it, everybody can agree to it. Before that, it was more precise and people didn't, you know, had a problem with it. So now we have CEFR and, and, and the Thais have developed their own CEFR set of scales because they didn't like the original CEFR scales. And I'm sure that everybody does this. So what so, do you think, Andrew, is the solution? Because I've got my own, but I always have my own and, you know, what do you think? Well, nobody's going to like what I'm going to say. Because everybody loves rubrics, everybody loves, uh, uh, you know, um, apparent precision in, uh, in, in ratings and so on. If I speak to all of you, I don't need a proficiency rating scale to rate you. You're all C2. You may not sound like an American or a, or a whatever, but you're all C2. And I don't, and I know it. Let's call it intuitively, because I'm an experienced listener of English. Okay. I don't have to. I don't have to put you through an IELTS, which is going to polarize all sorts of things and make you look weaker than you really are. By the way, all right? So you, some of you may may score nine. Some some of you may score eight. Some of you may score seven. But in reality, when we talk to each other, you're all at the highest level. But it's your lives will get destroyed. If you go and do IELTS and get 6.0. Uh, so in Australia, if you are a resident or a citizen, you can undertake the study at university at any level. So PhD level or master's or undergraduate without any test, which was good because I hardly spoke any English when I started my undergraduates. <laughs> 
I wouldn't have passed anything. English was my like fourth language or something. I wouldn't have passed it. Um, yeah. And the corrections I got from Andrew once I was doing my PhD, he looked at my work and he just said, don't understand, don't understand, don't understand. That was his corrections. And you know what? And I thought to myself, ah, he's stupid or something. He doesn't understand. I'll tell him. And that's how I learned to write. Because someone said they didn't, I didn't need much explanation. Just someone said, what the heck is here? So I wrote, I'll tell you what it is here. And then from one sentence, I had three pages. And that's how I learned to write. I realized that what's in my head, it's not in yours, it's not in his. So, um, But that's the key to learning. That's the key to language learning. What's right. Not, so, what's in my head is not what's in your head. So I think that um, we need to think for ourselves. And I think that my point really was to for an academic or the group or a team to sit down together and look maybe at those scales and also maybe look at the Australian curriculum, but only at the structure of it, not at the detail of how to teach. Because how to teach was written by teachers who have been doing this for 50 years and were nowhere near perfection or even good things, as recent tests show. But just look at the, the intentions of the objectives and how they structure things and look at the intentions and paperwork behind the the European framework, and just write something more or less in terms of syllabus or, or curriculum for yourselves in terms of, you know, a halfway of how to do, uh, do assessment. And I like this expression, rather, be, rather than being submissive to someone else's money or someone else's mindsets, I think put your, uh, what, what's the expression, Lala? To assert your authority over the discursive situation. I've learned it like when I was 20 something, right? Assert your authority over a discursive situation. Obviously, I'm not that smart to create it. It was Professor Anne Friedman who was first at the University of Queensland and then she's migrated to University of Melbourne. But she wrote that beautiful sentence, you know, to assert your authority. To assert your authority, you have to get informed. But then once you're informed, you don't just let other people tell you, oh, just do what I tell you. You go like, why should I do your stuff? Lovely to hear from you. Tell us more. <laughs> and you have your own, you stand your own ground. Yeah. And I think that's the solution um, to, to, to be like clear about your own understanding of things, which is what would have helped that paper. Can I just say one thing about CEFO? and about the simplification of CEFR. I mean, people look at CEFR, they say the six levels, okay, that's very nice. In, in first semester, we will do A1, in second semester, we will do A2, in third semester, we'll do B1, B2, and then by the end of six semesters, we'll be at C2. No, 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 that's not how it works, because the distance between A2 and B1, for example, is not, one, is not the same as the distance between B, B1 and B2, is not the same as the distance between B2 and C1 the distance to get from B2 to C1 is quite large. And the distance to get from A2 to B1 is, not, is, 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 is perhaps manageable. So there's uh, um, Pierce and the publishers have done some studies on that, which indicate that it, precisely that the distance is not the same. So you can't just say, you know, we're going to spend one term per, per level. But people look at it and say, oh, yeah, we'll do one term per level. You know, you may need four terms per level at, at the B2 level or the B1 level. Yeah, like the distance between the proficient speaker and native and, and native like proficiency, say, in English. We used to have in Australia, and Andrew will know, um, Australian, what was it called? ASLP, Australian Scale. The Australian Second Language Proficiency Rating Scales. And basically, the distance between number four and five was the universe. Mm. So you could be really good. Like, we're all here at level four. But level five meant knowing the literature, knowing the uh, sayings, you know, like uh, joking, knowing the culture, knowing every movie in English, right? So basically, it meant having been through um, Anglo-Saxon education to actually have enough past accumulated to respond to all these prompts, which are cultural, but very often foreign to people who learned it as a second language. 
So yeah, I, I think it's a good point, but maybe you know, dividing it by semester. I've written and, something and, here, and, but and I'm not. Thing, just a minute. And the other thing to remember about that is whose Anglo-Saxon culture are we talking about? It really doesn't matter, more or less. Well, well it know, does. Well, it does because you know, if you're a Black American, your your Anglo-Saxon culture is different from 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 a mid Midwestern American, from right, a, from, a New, from a New Yorker, and from no, and from a Londoner. Yes, but you do not want. So I teach uh, I teach English literacy. I teach teachers how to teach English literacy in Australian schools, right? So in regard to this point, Andrew. Uh, whether you are doing so it's cultural competence, however we call it a different level of schools. The point is, you do not want with your education to reveal that all you know is your neighbor and your mother, which which frames you as I'm black American living in the ghetto of New York, blah, 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 and I don't know anything beyond that. Because then you're not educated. You are just socialized to your ghetto. Or, you know what I'm saying? You, you, with your education, you need to have be... An, education should enable your expansion. And that's the difference between the, um, so, so that's what education nowadays wants. When we have this en masse education, when we massif massified education, massificated or massified education, we want now all children to have access to possibilities which more or less were available to rich children, right? Rich children traveled. Rich children had nannies of uh, with different languages and all of that. So Trump's daughters, uh, granddaughter speaks Chinese, for example, right? all that. So that's what we want to achieve. And if you have an Aboriginal child and the Aboriginal Australian Aboriginal child comes to the kindergarten or the school, you don't want because very often my colleagues um, think that cultural um, awareness means continuously impregnating this child with the view that they are Aboriginal. No, they are citizens of the world, like everybody else is. So you want that Aboriginal child to know their family, to know their back backgrounds, to know who is who, but also to know that there is more people in, in, in the world than just his family. Now, what, the reason I mentioned this actually is not for, for, for what you were saying, and I, no one would disagree with that. The reason I mentioned it is because there is a a prevailing discourse in, in the TESOL world that you have to teach English and its culture. And that is a meaningless statement. English and its culture. What is the it? Its culture that we're talking about. Is it but London culture? Is it American culture? Is it Thai culture of, in, in English? I mean, what is this magic? And, and Dr. Haider was talking about it in terms of the, the, the kind of syllabus that we're having where the culture may not be to know about the London underground just because you bought Jack Richard's book. Um, you know, and some people even, even in Thailand are now saying that the curriculum is too white. In other words, by, and by white, they mean that it is, it is dealing with, <laughs> this is a very difficult discussion, and I'm not going to have it now, but if it's, it, by white, they mean that it is too much focused on, uh, on, on, on things which are not related to the immediate context of students. But so in other a... words, no, 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 but, but we're, not, we're not going to have that discussion because it's, it's going to take us another three hours. So, <laughs> so um, I, I, I think it's really important to, to note that this is a kind of nonsense statement that is prevalent in this TESOL discourse. We're going to teach English and its culture. Oh, okay. So what are we going to teach them? We're going to teach them, oh, you know, in, in London they have the underground or in, in, in uh, I mean, what? I mean, discourses like this were available already in the 70s and 80s. You know, like, it's just like we need to move on. Okay, but Dr. Haida, would you like to give us some summarizing statement and we might finish for today and Andrew and I, or especially I, I will see you on Monday after I call off my teaching with my postgraduate students on Monday. Right. Thank you so much. I would like to say, just to say thank you for having me and, um, you know, as much as um, how, you know, how true and how I would agree uh, to Prof. Andrew's statement to a certain extent, uh, you know, it's just that it's very frustrating somehow that, um, we are only able to, you know, to write about the problems, but, you know, it's beyond our control because everything is decided by the other parties, you know. 
So it's very um, frustrating as well to know that sometimes the person in charge of the, let's say the policy makers, the person in charge, they are not in the field. So they don't know how it works. And, you know, all they do is just come up with certain framework to, to scale or to rate the learners. But, you know, and, and for us to be in the field and to understand what are the problems, the only thing that you are able to do is only to write and publish and hoping that, you know, changes will be made. So I hope that, you know, in the future, there'll be more um, openness to this, to have more discussion on this. Let's say, you know, even if there's nothing could be done from the other parties, at least we as individuals, we can do something about it and have this um, sort of discussion and exchanging opinions would, you know, would also be helpful to provide insight to what's actually going on and what's actually happening. Yeah. Thank you, Kendall. And Lala, summarizing statement, how's your department going with your influences? <laughs> We're actually working on uh, CFR, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite jealous with Malaysia. I mean, however problematic the CFR in Malaysia, Malaysia has uh, a better English proficiency index, uh, according to EF. So um, um, I'm hopefully in the next 10 or 20 years, um, we can be closer to uh, the EPI of Malaysia, Anya. Yeah, it's a lot of work to do, but let's uh, just do it. And I hope to work uh, on more collaborative projects with Dr. Haida, because next week, uh, my university and your university will sign an MOA, I believe, in Pontianak. So I will send you an email so we can uh, work on many, many projects in the future. Right, and one of the, one of them could be to integrate the work of graduate students or postgraduate students and your colleagues for publications, right. and then right. generate research projects from that, and then apply for publications in other journals. Yeah. I think that that is a lovely conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Haida, for participating in our podcast. Thank you so much, Karen, everyone, for having me. For telling us a lot about your beautiful journal. And where is it here? There it is. Your beautiful journal and everything that is there for us to actually see. And I encourage everyone to check, um, check out the journal and maybe publish if you can. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you so you. much, everyone. Nice seeing everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.